Good afternoon, good morning. Welcome to everybody who's joined us for the last of the sessions of the Global Mental Health Action Network annual meeting. Um, I'm really, really pleased to have a very full panel today to talk about how we tackle mental health stigma and discrimination. We have panelists from a range of countries and backgrounds and organizations. They're here to inspire you, for you to learn about that, what they're working on and learn more and helpfully share some of what they're doing with, with your own colleagues and your network and followers. In terms of the session, really the objective today is an introduction. It's an introduction to explore stigma and discrimination in different settings, what can be done to address it, to let you know about new analysis of upcoming resources. We'll talk about the new Lancet Commission report that's coming out, new papers and analysis from the Lancet, um, work that's been done and resources that are available to you to use with families and with other um, with different organizations and the work that the CDC Africa is going to be doing. We want to also share best practice and examples of programs and approaches from around the world and to inspire all of you to get involved in helping reduce stigma and discrimination. For today's webinar, we will be um, encouraging you to please use the chat. So to introduce yourself, please put where you are, where you're coming from. Um, it's always lovely to know who's here. So please add your name, which organization you're representing, where, which country you're coming from, and also use the chat wherever you'd like to ask questions. And I will look at the chat and we'll be asking questions a bit later, ones that are shared in the chat from the different um, members of the audience. You'll also be able to watch a recording of the webinar later. So we will put that up on the um, United for Global Mental Health YouTube channel. And we also put up the notes from the session as well. Um, thank you very, very much for being here. I will say that the topics discussed in this session may be triggering for some people, and we aim to make this event a safe environment for all. If you feel that you need any support, please refer to the resources that will be shared in the chat, and please feel free to, you know, um, to end your participation in the session or take a break. You will be able to get access to the notes and the support afterwards as well. So I'm going to turn straight over to Charlene. Welcome, Charlene. Um, you're from the Global Mental Health Care Network. Do you want to say what that is and then explain what the Lancet Commission Report on Mental Health Stigma and Discrimination is going to say? Thank you very much, Sarah. Yes. So the Global Mental Health Peer Network is an international lived experience organization. We pride ourselves by being 100% lived experience across all our structures. And we are based at the moment in um, 40 countries. Uh, so we have lived experience from all those. Yeah, so to get to the Lancet Commission, so what it's going to say. It's quite an exciting report. And I think the essence of the report is a call for ending stigma and discrimination in mental health. It presents uh, both evidence and experience on the impact of mental health um, of stigma in mental health. It also speaks about best practices. Um, there's across the report, there's powerful lived experience quotes or narratives, um, including some poems uh, related to stigma. Um, and that really brings the realities to the forefront of what people with mental health conditions are experiencing in terms of stigma and discrimination at various levels. So I think it's important to note that the report was co-produced by people with lived experience who were among the commissioners, the advisors, and we also had a dedicated lived experience writing group who commissioned a survey, a survey for people with lived experience, um, kind of to gather more information about what they experience and what their views and opinions are related to stigma. We had approximately 300 responses from that survey uh, from people across 45 countries. And what was good is that the most of those were actually from low and middle income countries. Um, the report also defines stigma and it summarizes the impacts of stigma. Uh, on four domains, it looks at stigma uh, in terms of personal impacts, kind of self stigma, you know, quality of life and the use of services. It looks at structural impacts and that means the legal and human rights issues and the implementation of psychosocial interventions. It also looks at the impact on health and social care. 
And the fourth domain, it looks at social and economic impacts. And that means stigma, for example, at in the workplace. So the evidence for effective interventions to reduce stigma is summarized in an umbrella review. And that included a 260s review uh, of papers. So quite a large number. There's also a number of major programs uh, to deliver anti-stigma interventions across the world that were analyzed quite in detail. The report also looked at the role of the media, both the traditional and the newer digital media. And finally, there are eight key recommendations. And those were like, that. those are specifically at uh, targeted audiences like international organizations, governments, employers, the health and social care sectors, the media, and also what people with mental health conditions themselves can do to help uh, promote and also implement some of these recommendations, local communities and civil society. I think it's, a, it's, it's all of our business, so we all need to be involved. So those uh, recommendations to really look at all of that. So that is the report. In, in the Thanks, Sally. It's going to be a mighty tome, quite a big report, but it's important for us in our work. So we wanted to let you know that it's coming and it will be launched on World Mental Health Day. So more information on that to follow. I'd like to say thank you so much for everyone who's been joining and putting that information in the chat. There's a really great range of countries and organizations that are represented. I'm gonna move if that's okay to Caitlin. Um, I just wanted to ask, if we put, go back to what are some of the causes and impacts of stigma and discrimination? Or what, the reason that we're here, what, what have you seen as some of the causes and impacts of stigma and discrimination in the communities and families that you work with? Caitlin, do you want to unmute? Of course. In our work with the Family Acceptance Project, we focused on increasing family support to prevent mental health risks and promote well-being. And we've studied underlying needs in research and then developed a family support model and multilingual family support resources to decrease suicidality, depression, related mental health risks, bullying, promote well-being. We know that from research on children and adolescents in general, that family support is extremely important. It contributes to well-being and helps protect against mental health risks and address stigma. Because of widespread access to information about LGBTQ lives, children and youth are self-identifying at much younger ages. Increasingly in childhood, they're coming out as LGBTQ, which means the need for, for family support is really paramount. But across cultures, LGBTQ identities are stigmatized and family rejection and discrimination increase mental health risks. In our research, for example, LGBTQ young people who were highly rejected by their families are more than eight times as likely to attempt suicide, nearly six times as likely to report high levels of depression, to be at much higher risk for drug abuse and sexual health risks, including risk for HIV. In fact, our research identified more than 50 specific family rejecting behaviors that parents and caregivers use to try to change their child's LGBTQ identity in the family. We know that conversion therapy happens outside the family, but change efforts happen inside the family. And we've seen similar rejecting behaviors across cultures. These family change efforts, such as preventing a child from learning about their LGBTQ identity, or excluding them from family events and activities to try to change or prevent a child's sexual orientation or gender identity, they're, they're transmitted through cultural and religious beliefs. So they're very widespread. And these rejecting behaviors can be traumatic for LGBTQ young people. They're shame-based. They isolate LGBTQ young people from sources of support. Family rejection and lack of support increases mental health challenges for LGBTQ young people and gender diverse children with underlying mental health conditions. So the need to engage families as advocates as a buffer against stigma and discrimination really becomes paramount. And that's the really focus of our work. Thank you, Caitlin. I think that's really important. 
a number of organizations have been particularly focusing on LGBTQ issues um, during Pride Month. Um, and it's important that it's a year round uh, lifelong issue. It's not just for one month or even one day. Um, Peter, you've just launched a series of papers. Congratulations um, on mental health and HIV. Would you like to talk a bit more and talk about how stigma and discrimination is a part of those? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks for the question. So, I mean, the series, uh, congratulations really to the authors who contributed to contributed the papers. It's published in collaboration with the Lancet Child and Adolescent Health and the Lancet Psychiatry. As you say, it came out today and it comprises three papers that are looking at the alignment of mental health and HIV services um, for three populations. Those are adolescents, substance users and many have sex with men. All three of the papers highlight the detrimental effects of, um, of stigma, particularly to the well-being of these populations. And obviously, uh, different types of stigma affect, affect the groups. For all three groups, um, misconceptions about living with HIV can be stigmatizing, as can attitudes towards mental ill health. And um, that can be a particular problem um, for adolescents. 25% of adolescents with HIV meet criteria for some sort of psychiatric disorder. And, uh, and this can lead to all sorts of problems for them, as you can imagine, you know, from exclusion and bullying to problems accessing healthcare. For substance users, their stigma is associated with their substance use. And for many who have sex with men, um, who I'm inevitably going to refer to as MSM at some point, because that's just what we do in HIV. Um, so forgive me for the use of the abbreviation. Um, there's stigma associated with their sexuality and lifestyle. Um, and this stigma can contribute to disproportionate mental health problems and HIV transmission in this population. So the impact of stigma, I think, is best illustrated with a couple of examples from the papers in the series. In the paper on substance users, um, the authors give an example of dropping clinics in, uh, for drug users in Kenya, where stigmatization of HIV has led to patients who have HIV going to seek care elsewhere or leaving the clinics entirely. Or some providers of substance use care can um, can be uncomfortable discussing sex and sexuality. Um, so they, they won't address HIV topics. And this is really a missed opportunity for tackling mental ill health and HIV. In the paper on adolescents, there's an example of how for adolescent girls who become pregnant, layered stigma around HIV status, sexual activity, and early pregnancy might prevent them from accessing the appropriate care for any one of those three conditions. So really, the three papers show how detrimental discrimination and stigma can be to accessing appropriate uh, care for um, provision of HIV and mental ill health, um, but also how the common co-occurrence of HIV and mental ill health really means that a closer alignment of care could have great advantages in effectively and efficiently tackling, tackling these uh, syndemic conditions. But a key component of closer alignment must be finding ways to tackle and overcome the stigma surrounding HIV, mental ill health, and the many other factors that might lead to stigmatization and discrimination against these populations. Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much for that. And there's been some information put in the chat about the different papers. There's obviously a lot of information there in those papers, and it's really recommended people reading them. I wanted to turn to Dimsani now about the Africa CDC. So if you could explain what the Africa CDC is and their new strategy, your new strategy, because I was particularly interested that the Africa CDC has committed to helping governments take action on stigma and discrimination. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, just to, to start us off um, with what Africa CDC is, um, Africa CDC is a public health agency um, which was formed from um, a declaration by um, the African Union member states, um, which uh, at the current moment, I would say we are five years old, which means it was formed in 2017. And um, if we can recall on the activities that were happening back then in public health, particularly in the continent, we had an Ebola outbreak in West Africa, which was sort of a commissioning of the organization to say, we need an institution that is going to be responsible for Africa's public health. And that is how Africa CDC came about. And since then, we have been mostly working on pandemics, outbreaks, pandemics, outbreaks. And I think um, from all these pandemics we have dealt with, we have actually generated a lot of lessons 
particularly on how to respond and how to um, re react to emergencies, which has brought us to a point where by now we say, what are we doing in terms of preparedness um, as an institution? Because responding all the time is not enough. We also need to be prepared. And uh, that brings me to uh, speak about one of the division that is within the Africa CDC, which is the disease um, a division of disease control and prevention, where we're looking at how can we now control, particularly though looking at the prevention part, which is the unit responsible for NCDI, which is non-communicable diseases and injuries and mental health is housed, where we recently um, launched and validated um, the first strategic plan on NCDIs and mental health for Africa CDC, which focuses on the non-communicable diseases, injuries, and mental health. And um, for, for the interest of today's uh, discussion, I'll focus more on the mental health aspect of it, where we have um, a strategic plan which was developed in a, a consultative manner, you know, what I would call the bottom-up approach. When we started, we engaged all 55 member states um, doing surveys, consultation on what are the areas they feel need to be attended to on NCDs and mental health. We got that feedback, we consolidated, and then we reached out to academic institutions, um, organizations who have people with lived experience because we wanted this to be a very inclusive um, document other than one of those where you just go gather information and you come back and you develop a document. So in, in this document we have, we, we did all these consultations as a build up. It's a process that started as early as 2019 actually, which came up to be validated this very much this year, when we, even with that, we didn't sit here in Ethiopia Addis Ababa headquarters to say, now it's the time we've gotten everything, we have to validate this document. We called upon the member states where everything began. They came through and in the surprise of things, regardless of all what's happening with COVID and travel restrictions, we were able to have 42 member states coming in, um, six ministers representing all the five different regions to come and validate and launch this strategic document, which has a couple of interesting um, uh, areas, should I say strategic objectives, which speak to mental health. And for today's um, interest, I would say, it's one of the most covered um, areas, issue of stigma and discrimination on mental health in the strategic document. Because we've got the first objective on, on mental health, which speaks about enhancing the capacity of member states, ministries of health and national public health institutes to develop, um, integrate and implement national and supranatural frameworks and policies for the prevention and control of um, mental health and uh, mental ill health. One of the key interventions in that aspect of it is to empower member states to review and uh, reform laws that um, discriminate against people with psychosocial disabilities. That's one of the most key interventions that we have developed as, an, as, as Africa CDC to try and say, we appreciate the space we are working in. We have very primitive laws which, decriminal, which criminalizes and discriminate on people with psychosocial disabilities, which tentatively speaks to mental health and mental health related issues. And one of the other interesting areas um, within the very same key areas, because usually when you have a strategic document, you know that number one is the high level, um, the highest priority, and then number two in that particular order. And our second um, objective, which speaks directly um, to the issues of mental health is we are at Africa CDC, we are looking at advocating for political commitment towards NCDs, injuries, and mental health. We, we know what the African Union brings to the plate when it comes to lobbying and coordinating. The African Union has the biggest political um, consumination of member states coming together. And when the member states make a declaration, it becomes a law unto the countries because this is an institution that speaks on behalf of all of the member states. So with Africa CDC in that space where we have the political will and we have the people who can make the declarations on behalf of the member states, it literally says we, we do have the capacity to lobby member states to change the, the, the policies at, at country level and change all of these other different aspects. So um, with, with that being said, all of our strategic um, objectives and strategic 
priority interventions, they speak directly to the issue of stigma and discrimination on mental health. And this would be a very interesting um, subject to discuss moving forward because this is a first of its kind. And um, as Africans, I would say we are very much proud to now have this kind of a document, which is going to be sort of a flagship and a benchmark for all of the work we're going to be doing moving forward and making sure that we have the element of alignment and coordination, which fits directly to Africa Cities' mandate of coordinating public health issues and also making sure that we support member states in uh, uh, system strengthening and making sure that the public health systems in all our member states are up to standard and ready for responding to emergencies and also the integration of mental health into emergency response and preparedness. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dinsani. That's really helpful. So I wanted, um, I said it was really important, as, as Dinsani said, to say that the African CDC has made this commitment and is working with member states and that all African member states have agreed that they want to work on stigma and discrimination and they want to review laws and improve legislation. Um, I hope that, Sierra, that Joshua will be able to join us from Sierra Leone where he's been doing a huge amount of work on the form of legislation, but we know of partners in a range of countries currently working to reform mental health legislation, whether that's Kenya, Nigeria, there are a lot of countries where there need to be reform. So thank you, Dinsani. It's really great to have you here. Um, David, I invited you to speak about why medical educators need to work on stigma and discrimination. Could you say a bit more about your organisation and, and your thinking on that? Yes, of course. And it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, the World Federation for Medical Education is the non-state actor in direct relation to the World Health Organization uh, with, and we are charged with the remit of improving medical education everywhere in the world, worldwide. Uh, so quality improvement in medical education. And when you say the question is how good is medical education, uh, then we're not uh, saying to our members um, uh, exactly what is the content of education. And I think that is a thing that is very difficult to manage in the multicultural context. Um, I was for many years the dean of a, a very large medical faculty in the UK and where we had a large department of psychiatry and a very um, active psychiatry program. But in many other parts of the world, psychiatry or the understanding of mental health is not nearly as important as it should be in the curriculum and in the overall pattern of medical education and medical care. So that's a thing that we have to uh, encourage. Um, and uh, from some of those speakers already, uh, we hear very positive things, but I could tell you awful things about countries where there's no belief in any kind of mental health care at all, which is um, very important. The other thing in my own history is that before I went to the University of Manchester and that large medical faculty. Uh, I worked for the Wellcome Trust, a very large charity, and I was responsible for what was probably the largest privately funded program of research in uh, mental health uh, in the world. Um, and uh, it was a very stimulating and rewarding thing to be involved in. But the part that I found of particular interest uh, is a, a related element within the Wellcome Trust, and that is to deal with uh, subjects such as ethics and anthropology and social uh, science in relation to medicine. And I, I was very struck by the way in which uh, physicians interested in mental health demonstrated in their writing, first, their ability to work effectively with other health and social care professionals. It's not a thing just for the mental health professionals alone. It depends on the social, anthropological, economic context. And uh, in that regard, I would commend a couple of authors. Um, uh, some of you will know the work of the late Paul Farmer. Uh, and if you look him up on Wikipedia, you can then follow uh, areas in which he worked, where he demonstrated as an infectious disease physician, he wasn't a psychiatrist, the way in which uh, misunderstanding and stigma could uh, hugely damage the care of the individual, not just his or her disease, whatever that might be, but 
he or she as a real and whole person. And um, another anthropological physician I would commend is Dr. Arthur Kleinman, that's Kleinman spelt with a K. And again, if you look at him up on Wikipedia, you can follow his writings and the way in which the um, common model of uh, mental health care is inappropriate when you are not looking at the society as a whole and the way in which societies can convey uh, discrimination and stigma. So I think the important thing is that this at this point is to say that we need to improve it in medical education. We need to be sure in those parts of the world where it's regarded as unimportant, it is actually recognized as being important and to work with other related disciplines, perhaps some of them not in the healthcare field. Thank you, David. I think that's really good advice. And I hope Charlene, as the Lancet commissioners pull together their findings and think about how they want to present the commission report. I think some of those points are clear, but the, the need to go beyond the health profession, to talk to other professions, to think about stigma and discrimination in the wider context of society. And I think that's something Caitlin has already spoken to as well. Um, I'd like to come back to Caitlin, if that's okay, and ask a bit more about that. Uh, as David says, stigma and discrimination is more than just um, mental health and the mental health profession, or even um, a medical issue. What, what have you found to be good solutions to stigma and discrimination that you've been able to support to come through your work? Sorry, Kate, did I need you to unmute? There we go. Sorry about that. Um, our focus has been on families. Uh, I really identified that as a critical unmet need that contributed to stigma and also lost lives early at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic when I worked in the American South. And it took a long time to be able to mobilize the resources to study families because no one had studied families before we did this work. In fact, families were seen as an adversary and as incapable of learning to support their LGBTQ children. But going back into the 1970s and 80s, there was the emergence of research that showed how important families are for adolescents in helping promote well-being and protecting against risk. So 20 years ago, we did the first research, we started this first research on LGBTQ young people and families and not only looking at rejection, but also acceptance. And we identified more than 50 behaviors that parents and caregivers use to affirm and support their LGBTQ children. And we found that these accepting and supportive behaviors help protect against risk, suicidality, depression, substance abuse, and that it also promoted self-esteem, overall health and well-being. And one of the very important uh, family accepting behaviors that we identified and measured was advocacy, parental advocacy. So part of what we do is um, we've developed a family support model that helps diverse families learn to support their LGBTQ children. And that's aligned with the family's underlying cultural and religious values. We do a thorough assessment before we start working with families to learn about their values and beliefs and what they know about sexual orientation and gender identity. And so we've actually helped many families that are highly conservative and rejecting learn to support their LGBTQ children. And part of that is helping to stand up for that child when others mistreat them, not only in the family system, but in their congregations and schools and their communities. And so we've shown that, um, that families can actually become a force of social change, that in fact, we've worked with conservative, religiously conservative families that then created organizations within their religion that then became international to help engage families as advocates. Um, peer support is really incredibly important for diverse families to get support from other parents and families like themselves to learn how to support their LGBTQ children. And we connect them uh, with peer support to learn from other parents from their cultural and religious backgrounds. And we can also screen for family rejecting behaviors early on to identify emerging mental health risks 
and provide support services, mental health services, family support services early on. But I think one of the most exciting opportunities in engaging families to learn to care for and nurture their own LGBTQ children is so many of them become aware of the need to support other people's children. And this really can lead to uh, a very powerful force. There's nothing more powerful than parents, especially mothers to advocate for their LGBTQ children and to advocate for appropriate laws and policies and resources and services so that parents become an active force really in helping build civil society and actively fight stigma. And stigma is reinforced at the family level. So the ability to change families uh, offers us the opportunity to change our communities. Thank you so much, Caitlin. So you talked about family support, parental advocacy, the, the particularly the power of mums, which I think all of us will attest to, um, the peer support, and then being able to screen for vulnerable children or people that they need a support. I think just to prompt you, but I think the resources that you have are in multiple languages. Did you want to let people know some of the languages that your support is in, and then we can share that on the link? Um, I, if I forget any of them, they're in 10 languages, and we have a version for indigenous families and communities, American Indian families and communities. So there are 11 versions of our, of our family um, Healthy Futures posters that are actually behind me. And uh, I'll put the link in the chat. And we also have developed family education booklets that I'm actually looking for funds now to update them. But those are in English, Spanish, and Chinese. And we started a version, a faith-based series. We've disseminated over 600,000 copies of those booklets in 70 different countries. And because our materials are online, people download them uh, from all over. And we've been working with 23 Spanish speaking countries to disseminate our posters there and with some of the Asian countries. And I'm really hoping to develop more language versions because as we know, posters are forces of change all over the world and they're simple. Literacy is a very important aspect of our work. So we work hard to make sure that our work is culturally relevant and it speaks to um, the families for whom language is really the key to learning to support their child. You can't talk about heart issues with a second language, emotion and love and fear and concern. Those really need to be communicated in your birth language. And so that's why we use different languages. Thank you so much. Well, we put some of the links in the chat for people who are interested. But I remember, um, for example, Hindi is one, um, a, another language that they're available in. So have a look. And if they're useful to you, please, please um, take a look and see if you can share them with your networks. Um, Peter, you've heard, we've heard a bit about some of the challenges of stigma and discrimination. Can you remind us, what are some of the recommended actions from the new papers? how to tackle stigma and help prevent and treat HIV. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, so in my response, uh, I can't go into all the nuances or details of the recommendations that are given in the papers. And there's so many sort of practical solutions covered and so ideas put forward. So I do urge you to take a look at the series. Um, I'll just go through a few of the, uh, yeah, a few, a few of the sort of things that stick out with some common themes perhaps that link through. So um, in the paper on, uh, on men who have sex with men, the authors, for example, point out that improving access to and quality of mental health support services for this population is essential to ending the HIV epidemic, which is one of the key goals. And that really means dealing with stigma. One of the starkest stigmatizing factors for this population of men who have sex with men in some of the countries with high HIV burden is criminalization of same-sex activity. There's more than 70 countries in uh, countries in the world that have some laws prohibiting same-sex relationships. And decriminalization of same-sex behaviors could dramatically increase the ability of many who have sex with men to be open about their sexuality and their identities. And that's essential to optimizing the use of mental health care and HIV prevention and treatment. In resource-limited settings where same-sex behavior is criminalized or highly stigmatized and therefore difficult to address directly in care, treating some uh, common elements of mental health, so providing emotional, cognitive, interpersonal and behavioural support um, and training lay providers to provide the sort of support in the community or in clinics 
um, can be effective approaches uh, to tackling stigma and making care accessible. Training physicians, counsellors and HIV service providers in the care of men who have sex with men specifically to encourage men who have sex with men to seek psychological help and to address the intersectional stigmas of HIV, risk and disease, sexuality, gender identity and mental health um, is also recommended. Um, for substance use and HIV care, um, the authors of the substance use paper give two really nice examples from from Spain um, about how the care can be integrated. So one in Madrid where a harm reduction clinic recruited an HIV care specialist who was able to initiate antiretroviral therapy for people in, with HIV who weren't on antiretroviral therapy. And another outpatient drug use treatment facility in Barcelona was staffed by a team of psychiatrists, infectious disease experts and psychologists, really being able to provide holistic care in which all the staff were trained to deal sensitively with multifaceted factors that contribute to stigma um, and discrimination experienced by substance users who have HIV. The paper dealing with adolescents had a community panel which contributed to their findings um, and consultations with adolescents in South Africa highlighted the importance of respectful and non-stigmatizing treatment within clinics from healthcare providers, but not just healthcare providers. When accessing a clinic, clinic, it's important that all staff are trained to um, be sensitive and to not uh, stigmatize the people using the clinic, and that can include um, security staff and, and, and receptionists. Um, for adolescents, uh, peer support networks can help overcome stigma and, and embedding community representatives in clinic settings and HIV and mental health programs can really help to overcome stigma and other barriers to care. And as Caitlin mentioned, for young people with HIV um, and from all three of the populations considered in the series, family support can be pivotal in supporting well-being. For all groups, uh, training of healthcare workers in how to sensitively tackle mental health and HIV needs is essential to reduce stigma and, and to make services more accessible. But in each setting and each population will pose different problems, but also different opportunities to overcome stigma and discrimination in mental health and HIV care. And there is no setting where addressing stigma as a barrier to care would not be possible in some way. Thank you, Peter. That's really helpful. I think it's given all of us something to do, because as you said, you've mentioned family support, you've mentioned training of health workers and physicians, you talked about societal support, even as you said, the security guards or the security personnel at clinics, everyone needs to be aware and do that bit to address stigma and discrimination. I'm really pleased to have Joshua Duncan here from the Mental Health Coalition in Sierra Leone, who has been working on mental health stigma and discrimination for a long time and has been doing amazing work. Welcome, Joshua. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Maybe you could say a little bit about the work that you've been doing in Sierra Leone. What are some of the things that people are experiencing by way of stigma discrimination and how you're trying to address it? Go ahead, Joshua. Yeah, thank you. Um, of course, we realize Sierra Leone has gone through quite a lot of crisis situation. Um, which ranges from 12 year old rebel war to fire to Ebola outbreak to corona crisis situation. And this has really been a key challenge for us in terms of the huge causes and the impact of stigma. And honestly, I realized that um, one of the key causes for stigma is the lack of care and the abandonment of patients in our country, which has been key. And when once they are in the street in a worse situation and because of lack of medication, of course, people would want to define others based on how they see them. And that has been quite a challenge. Also, we realize that there is this social and cultural perspective or construct which traditional perception reinforces. That is basically um, persons with mental illness uh, as a result of the wicked they may have done. And there is this belief in Sierra Leone that those who are involved in the rebel war has the blood fighting them or the spirit behind those they killed fighting them. 
so so much so that they deserve what is obtaining. In as much as it might be a traumatic scene, they are actually based on culture being blamed for either a crime they did or something else. And by extension, we realize there is this bias association relating to people who are poor, who are deprived. I mean, it stems from the perspective of because you are poor in society, it means you are trading your resource, your children, and your wealth to a spiritual entity. And the spiritual entity might also be overpowering you. And these are the reasons why you are showing signs and symptoms of mental health crisis situation. So stigma is huge. When I say huge, it's at a high level in our community. And as I speak to you, I am not talking from a theoretical point of view because I myself have experienced it quite a lot. Thank you, Joshua. I think that's really incredibly powerful to hear about the, the challenges around care and abandonment of people who, who deserve care, the traditional beliefs and the faith systems that can actually reinforce stigma rather than, than try and address it. And then, as you said, the bias, so the idea that people who are poor or deprived are that way for a reason, that somehow there's a, a punishment for something that they might have done or that their mental health is of less value than others. I think those are really hard issues for yeah. all of us and things that we all, all need to think about in our work. I think that the issues around care and abandonment is something we see in high income countries as well and on our streets. Um, so it's an issue everywhere that we express. I wanted to turn though to your works, Joshua, and then I'll come to others about how you sought to try and tackle some of those issues in, in Sierra Leone, what you've done to try and tackle stigma and discrimination in really difficult circumstances. Thank you. You might need to unmute. I'm not sure if there's a if the connection is good for you. There you go. Yeah, unmute. Is that okay? Again. No yeah. There is quite a lot of challenge in tackling stigma. Um, one of the key challenge has to do with our laws and policies that reinforces it. You would agree with me that it is only in the recent past that we are having I think Josh is having connectivity issues, um, but I might come back to him because he's been working on the reform of uh, a law that's over 100 years old, mental health in Sierra Leone. Oh, there you are, Joshua. Do you want to try again? Yeah. Um, since 1902, we have an old age mental health legislation. And this legislation speaks around isolation, speaks around alienation, speaks around keeping persons with lived experience in asylum, speaking about losing their property, speaking about terms like infirmity of mind. And so what we do to tackle stigma is to engage these policymakers around right policy, that focuses on the value of the individual and the returns in investment when once this policy has been put in place. The second thing we look at is around community dialogue. Sierra Leone has its central government, but there is a lot of authority among local leadership, traditional leaders. And when we talk about traditional leaders, in some communities, they are like the kings and the queens, they do not even know about the existence of a president or the like. So when customary laws are made, they seem very, very strong. So one of the approach we took is to, to bring these local leaders and key community stakeholders together to look at how we would be able to support people who are being stigmatized by having right laws in place. And ensure that the laws are reinforced, but has proven quite I mean, responsible to ensure that decisions are 
Joshua, I know your connectivity is at great, so I'm going to pause you there. But I, knowing the work that Josh has been doing, and we can share more, what you were saying was the importance of engaging policymakers to try and make sure that they understand the value of people with, lived, with living with mental health conditions and the return on investing in them, both social investment, community investment, as well as economic investment. And secondly, the importance of community dialogue, of the role of traditional leaders in trying to un undo learning, bad learning, as it were, on mental health and the problems around mental health. And his work at the moment is very much around laws and legislative reform for the 1902 Lunacy Act. And that's so 120 years old, that act. Um, Damasi, I'm very grateful you've been answering questions in the written chat um, about reform of laws around things that CDC are planning to do. Um, David, you've just heard a lot from Joshua and from the rest of the group about what they're doing. So I'm going to put you on the spot a bit and say, um, for you and for the um, World Federation for Medical Education, how would you like to work with others to reduce mental health stigma and discrimination? Well, working with others is a favourite phrase. Um, at a personal level, my daughter is a psychiatrist. And one of the things that attracted her into psychiatry as a medical specialty, rather than all the other things that she might have done, is that she actually loves, she loves the way in which the delivery of good quality mental health care is a team effort. It's not a doctor working alone. It's important to be working with the nursing team, social workers, with relevant people in the community, even the police. If you have a culture where the, you have a police force that is helpful, then they can be very important in helping people who are taken ill when they're out in the community or who are suffering discrimination as a consequence of their mental illness. So from that personal level, I'm a great believer that the problems of good mental health care and dealing with stigma very much depend on the team working together. There is, and, and, and obviously we at the World Federation very much commend that both uh, in, in the standards that we have written for medical education and so on. But it's not easy. Uh, it's not easy from our point of view because there's always a problem when the doctors say, let's do this together. Other professions will look at us and say, well, that's the doctors telling everybody what to do all the time. Uh, you know, don't they realize it's a team effort? So it's a very difficult thing to persuade my colleagues as physicians all over the world that good quality health care, not just in mental health, but very particularly in mental health, depends on uh, um, a, an effort in the healthcare team and more widely. Um, we are based uh, near Geneva so that we can be in good contact with the International Council of Nurses, the uh, Federation of uh, Pharmacists uh, and, and the other professions but it's not easy to break barriers down, but we are always keen to do so. How do we like to work with, uh, with others in dealing with stigma and uh, mental health? Uh, well, we'd like to very much, but it's difficult to break those professional barriers down. And all the time, I think it's very important that there isn't a medically led model. The physician, the doctor is a part of the team. He or she is not the leader of the team. He's, she, they're, it's a part of the team. Thank you, David. I think that's a great, a great message and something that's really important when we're talking about um, having a model of mental health care that's not a, a purely medicalized no. approach. No. And I think that's an important point that all of us have agreed on and have been discussed. Um, Charlene, you've heard lots of great interventions from all of this amazing group. Are you feeling inspired in terms of the Commission and what the Commission can do with all these wonderful people and those who are joining us today? Yes, um, I think for me, the Commission, the report is going to be a valuable advocacy tool. I think the fact, mere fact that it's comprehensive and it's written in a very, uh, a way that's easy to understand and like previously mentioned, it's a, it's a kind of a collaborative effort. Those uh, 
within health profession or non-health professionals in different sectors. So I think based on that, that anybody can use this report to really advocate, um, you know, for, for countries to really address uh, stigma issues, but also to implement the set recommendations. Um, just uh, maybe to mention what the peer network is planning to do specifically on the outcome of the report is we decided that we're going to adopt three of the recommendations and commit to craft advocacy initiatives around that for the next couple of years. We also decided that as part of this, we're going to launch our own stigma subcommittee so that we have our lived experience representatives um, kind of bringing forward that lived experience realities of uh, stigma through sharing, sharing their own stories. Um, as we know, sharing your recovery story is one of the most effective ways to destigmatize mental health conditions. Um, and I think yeah, ending stigma must not be just a conversation, uh, an end you know, after the report is launched. It needs to be a continued conversation. And I think this report is a tool that one could take forward and carry forward. Um, there's going to be um, materials developed such as infographic that really summarize the content. So you don't need to go look at this very lengthy report, but there will be materials that support people and getting the word out there and also using social media to spread the word and to push governments to, to do better in terms of mental health. Thank you. Thank you, Charlene. Um, Joshua, you've been part of the commission and you're part of the discussions on tackling stigma and discrimination. What are you looking forward to using a report like a Lancet Commission report to, to help you do? How will it help your work? Brilliant. Um, of course, you would agree with me that um, Sierra Leone is part of a wider team that have signed to a lot of conventions and uh, um, such documents that are reinforced even by WHO partners are taken very high by our government officials. So we will, we, will, we will look at it from three segments. The first segment is engaging government officials around the impact, the value of such a report. A report that speaks into an issue that is affecting a country that is firstly poor, second have gone through crisis situation, and third that has low priority in terms of government's standard of prioritization for different conditions, let's just say mental health as an issue. So this could be for us, I mean, an opportunity to advocate and to ensure that government is committed to ensuring that issues that affect people and the returns of their investment, if government does, would work. The second phase we will be looking at is our different actors, those in the field. Remember, we are a coalition of many actors. So we intend sharing this with our partner organization to have the rippling effect in their areas and scope of operation. Yeah. And when once this is done, it's it makes the multiplicity effects viable. And this is quite important for us. The third thing is to engage community around, I mean, a, re, I mean, a simple modified approach in which we might convert it either into posters or key messages via WhatsApp, buy into subsequent events or celebration and use these key messages to reach out to community actors. I mean, this is an, will be done in an inclusive way in which, I mean, persons with lived experience, those who are working and all actors will engage community for a change. Because when once enlightenment shows up, ignorance disappears. That's the kind of approach we intend to take. Thank you, Joshua. As usual, you said it much better than I ever could. Um, there have been a lot of questions, written questions and answers, which I'm very grateful to the panelists that they've been responding to some very detailed and thoughtful questions. Many for Damsani actually in the work of Africa CBC. So thank you so much for responding to those. I can see one more and also one for Peter as well. Um, but looking at the group as a whole, I'm going to ask you very briefly 
ideally in the length of a tweet to say, to end mental health stigma and discrimination, we need to, what? So, uh, Caitlin, to end mental health stigma and discrimination, what do we need to do? Could you unmute for me, sorry. We urgently need accurate information about sexual orientation and gender identity. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, Dimsani, what do we need to do to end mental health stigma and discrimination? Could you unmute me? Um, yes, thank you. Um, I would say we, we need to engage in multi-sectorial practice which will engage the political conversing um, of com political commitment and the promotion of mental health education and awareness. Thank you. So political commitment and men mental health education. Uh, Peter, what do we need to do? Um, I would say uh, we need to listen to the communities affected and involve them in service design and implementation. Brilliant, thank you. I've got a really great one in the chat which says to fight stigma, we need to talk more about mental health for everyone rather than mental health services. It's an interesting one. Uh, David is nodding. What would you say we need to do? <laughs> well, I, I think we need to be prepared to work across professional barriers, not just within the healthcare professions, but much more widely. Thank you. Uh, Charlene, what do we need to do? Well, ending stigma is everybody's business. Creating stigma-free communities is a human right. And people with lived experience are the key stakeholders who must inform and guide anti-stigma initiatives. Thank you. And Joshua, what do we need to do to end stigma and discrimination? You have said a bit already. If you unmute, you can unmute. Sorry, we need to come out with our story. We need to make people know that we have, have gone through and at the same time we have overcome. And if they too are able to come out with their story, it's one key way of demystifying and accepting stimulation and pushing back the frontiers of human ignorance that stigma as a whole to impede us from being what we really are. Thank you, Joshua. Sharing our stories, being brave and talking about what we've gone through and overcome. There's some really great ones coming through in the chat. Claire says, mobilize children and young people as mental health advocates. That's another one. Um, I think there'll be more coming through the chat in the next few minutes, but I wanted to say thank you so much to the panel. It's been a really whistle-stop tour of mental health stigma and discrimination from lots of different perspectives, which was deliberate and lots of different ideas about how to tackle mental health stigma and discrimination. It often feels a bit overwhelming for all of us working in mental health, but it is possible. And I think what we've heard today is some really inspiring ways that people are working to overcome mental health stigma and discrimination and things that you can also do too. In the chat, you'll see that you can register for the next webinar that will be, uh, we'll go back to our once a month webinar series um, after this. So the next webinar will take place in July and it'll be around intimate partner violence, the impact of violence around mental health. What can we do to address violence and mental health? Um, and then also, if you could keep looking out for more information about the notes from this session, about the recording, please feel free to share those. And by all means, share your thoughts about what you've learned today and use Twitter. And if you want to tag um, United for Global Mental Health, we'll be sure to retweet you. But thank you all so very, very much. It's such a pleasure to meet you all. I haven't met you all in person yet. Um, and please keep in touch and look out for the Lancet Commission on Stigma and Discrimination and Mental Health Report that will be here with us for World Mental Health Day. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.